Stars of track and field you are Stars of track and field you are Stars of track and field are beautiful people Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of Let's Run.com's Track Talk. This is Let's Run.com co-founder Robert Johnson. Welcome you to the show. What a show we have this week. So much to talk about. Noah Lyles, 19.50, the Peachtree Road Race. We've got, we're going to get you ready for Monaco this week. And at the end of the podcast, 50 minutes with Evan Jager. If you want to go to that right now, it's a great interview. Just skip to the final 50 minutes. Jonathan Gall got him exclusively. He talks about his injuries and stuff like that. But it's going to be a fantastic show today. And as usual, we're joined by my twin brother, Weldon Johnson, as well as Let's run a staff writer, Jonathan Gall. But we have a very special guest to begin the show, folks. The Theodore Roosevelt of the Mount Rushmore of Let's Run.com, Steve Soprano, the forgotten man. The man not normally on the podcast, but the man who writes every week more stuff that is read by you, the visitors, than anybody else. The man in charge of the homepage, Steve, has been down to the Peachtree Road Race. And more importantly, he's also seen the Olympic Marathon Trials course. The Atlanta Track Club, thanks to them, they fly to, paid for him to fly down there. Steve, welcome to your first Let's Run.com Track Talk podcast. Thanks. Happy to be here. Where does this rank on the highlights of your life? No, just kidding. So, Steve, you went down to Peachtree. Tell us, what was the race like? Were there just tons of people? Was it, like, bigger than any road race you've ever seen? Tell us a little bit about the road race, and then we'll get into what the course looks like for the marathon trials. Well, yeah, the race was great. Obviously, they put together, you know, two very good fields. And we had a couple of great races. As far as the race being bigger, I mean, it's kind of hard to get the sense of what it was like for someone running because I wasn't at the start line. I was It's a point-to-point course. So I was at the finish line. So if I was there running, it would have been a kind of a different experience. But the finish line area was just, you know, it reminded me of like a rock and roll road race where you had a lot of music, a lot of crowds at the finish. So, you know, it was a very big deal there for sure. Uh, anyone I talked to in town, you know, when I said what I was there for, they're like, oh, you know, they knew all about Peachtree. It wasn't like they didn't know it was happening. So definitely a you know big race for the town, and then yeah the two obviously the races turned out great. Got both event records, men and women. You put up a fifty thousand dollar bonus, and it was not neither one was like a sure thing. They were both very tough times, and it was hot conditions. But yeah, turned out they got two good days. Yeah, the races were pretty incredible. Ronix Capruto getting the men's record by a few seconds, and then the women's race, they were behind at five miles. Really had to kick it in hard, and Bridget Koskai. Barely gets the record, but she also barely beats Agnes Tirup. So she gets $58,000 in prize money and Tirup gets 2500 which is kind of crazy. But these people don't show up without some minor appearance fees as well. So I'm sure everybody went home happy, but Bridget's probably a lot happier than Agnes. And Steve, everyone in Atlanta may have known of the road race, but I saw a woman two days ago in New York City with a Peachtree road race shirt on it's probably 54th street between 6th and 7th avenues if you're a let's run listener i saw you i wanted to kind of go up and say something but you were talking to like a doorman so i, I didn't want to butt in but peach street everywhere that's funny that's yeah that's small world i guess Jeez. but yeah like you said uh the women's race was particularly exciting uh coming down to a nail biter finish you had three women tear up you know she did not seem very upset about losing based on you know kind of her demeanor at the finish line and her post-race interview she didn't look like someone who just lost $50,000. So that was nice. She seemed to have shrug it off pretty well. And then on the men's side, there wasn't a nail bite of her finish because Kipruto dominated, but it was just down to whether he got the record or not. And he only got it by three seconds. So that was kind of decided in the final, you know, half mile as well. Both races, exciting finishes because of that. Well, it's interesting, Steve, that you said Tirop didn't look disappointed because watching that race kind of looked like she got cut off by Brigitte Kozgai coming down the home straight. I mean, Kozgai clearly changed her, her running line. Was there any talk of that in the media area afterwards? Actually, there wasn't. It was, no one talked about it at all. When I watched it live, because I was, you know, you're, I'm typing up stuff on the message boards and watching the TV over in the corner. And so, like, I didn't even notice how kind of bad it looked online uh, initially when I first watched it. And then it was later when I was reading the message board threads that uh, I saw some people talking about it and I went back and rewatched it. And there's no doubt about it. Kaz guy was kind of weaving a little bit and, you know, did cut in front of Agnes, but Agnes didn't break stride at all. So I'm kind of thinking she had, you know, it's hard to tell from a front angle depth. So if you saw a side angle, I think would get a better judge of it. 
But it, uh, again, Tierop didn't break stride, so I don't think she was actually like cut off. She was just forced to go around. And we've seen this kind of thing in races before where there's no DQ or anything. Like off the top of my head, one of the biggest examples I can think of is, um, I think it was a 2014 USA Championships or 2015, whichever one was in Sacramento. I remember Molly Huddle and Shannon Roberry at the finish line of the 5,000. And Roberry did some weaving to force Molly Huddle to go wide. And, uh, and that's on a track where, you, you know, you're supposed to kind of keep your line coming into the home straight. And uh, there's no DQ there. I remember after the race, Molly Huddle was like, yeah, that was a fair move. You know, I thought that was a good tactic. I would have done the same thing. This seemed less egregious than that. So, uh, and again, there was no talk about a DQ or anything like that. Well, I, I got to interrupt here. I, I got to laugh about Molly Huddle saying no DQ. I mean, she's the one that famously what, what, threw her arms out at the <laughs> NYC half and, and, and wasn't DQ herself. So, of course, she's going to say no DQ. Actually, Steve did call me up, and he was going to start a th- thread about it. He's like, should I make a big deal about it? Because once we watched it, I think if this was involving an American, people would have made a big deal about it. But – I said, look, if Tierup's not upset about it, uh, I, we got to give her credit. I mean, she lost fifty over $55,000 because of this, but she didn't complain. So good stuff there. And good stuff to the Land Track Club. Not only did they pay Steve, the company not pay, but they covered his expenses to go down there. They came up with $200,000. I mean, we can debate whether the wheelchair races deserve the same, you know, course records bonus as, 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 the, as the regular racers, but they did pay it out. So they paid out for all four races. Two hundred fifty thousand dollars each, so they've got, I guess, plenty of money to fly Steve down there. If they're giving out two hundred grand. Well, yeah, they're also paying for hotel rooms for all of the people who qualify for the Olympic trials. I mean, they're they're doling out a lot of cash to put on these events, so definitely a lot of good support for the sport of running. Speaking of the Olympic trials, Steve, you got to preview the course the day after the race. What are your takeaways from the Olympic marathon trials course? Yeah, that was that was a really cool experience. Uh, especially as someone who you know used to aspire to make the Olympic trials, it was kind of cool to be you know part of that group, checking out the course and everything like that. Because I won't actually ever get to run it, but uh, it was it was an interesting course. It's not going to be a boring course at all. It's if you haven't seen the um, the elevation profile, we're going to have an article up later today. Uh, my article from you know just my experience there, but it's very hilly, uh, like. You know, this is not this is not anything close to a Chicago. This is much closer to a Boston, um, if not, you know, more hilly than Boston in the sense that it's just constant up and down. There's really no big sections of flat. Um, I don't think it's it's nothing crazy where it's like unfair or you know, kind of just a silly race. It's a uh, it's mostly gradual in the beginning. You start off the first of all, it's three, it's four loops three six mile loops and then a final 8.2 mile loop at the end where you're basically doing the first six miles of the six mile loop and then tacking on 2.2 miles and the loops the main six mile loops are actually it's mostly gradual hill you're doing gradual up gradual down and then it's in the last point two point two where i feel like the hills get a little bit steeper but uh there's nothing crazy where you know oh this hill is going to get like a name or something like that because i don't think any of them are that aggressive but it's just it's just a it's not, you know, it's not a rhythm course. It's not a course where you're just going to dial into a pace and go flat. Your pace is going to be changing constantly during the race. Uh, and I think it's going to make for a good, interesting spectator race and, you know, a fun race for the athletes. I got to say, I'm a little disappointed that there isn't a hill that you think is significant to give a name to. Because I always think it's, that's the coolest thing. Like you got Heartbreak Hill in Boston and Cemetery Hill at Van Cortland Park. It's always cool when a course has like a distinctive Hill, it's like, oh man, they're about to call out this thing. So that's a little bit of a bummer, but it does sound like it's a good course. Yeah, well, I mean, who knows? People, we, we could always come up with a name for something. That's, I mean, the thing about like, I mean, Cemetery is just an insane hill if you talk about Van Cortland Park, but Heartbreak Hill, my understanding isn't how difficult the hill is, it's where it comes in the course. So this course, maybe it will. I know I only ran 8.2 miles. So how that those hills at the end that I said were a little bit more aggressive, how they felt to me after an eight mile run is going to be very different than someone who just raced a marathon. So maybe those hills, I don't know, maybe they will get a little more infamous. When Yeah, I guess they named the Heartbreak Hill. It was named by a Boston Globe journalist. So maybe after the trials, depending on how the race goes, we come up with a name of us, name ourselves. Let's Run.com can name a hill on the Olympic trials course, even though it'll never really be used again. Well, yeah, and Peachtree has its cardiac hill, so it's not like uh, it's not like Atlanta's against you know, naming some of their hills there. Steve, you mentioned Van Cortland Park. How, how would you compare the hills to like the back hills of Van Cortland Park? 
Well, actually, it's funny we're talking about cross country because one of the cool things I thought one of the Atlantic Track Club guys told me was uh, when Ritz previewed the course, he's basically paraphrasing. He said basically it's like cross country meets the marathon, and in that sense, it's it is rolling hills. It's up and down. You know, the, compared to Van Cortland back hills, it's obviously not as as aggressive and uh, rolling where it's just you you you're shooting up you're shooting down one hill and shooting up the next, but it is. It is like the back hills in the sense that you're just really never running flat. I was taking out my phone to film parts of the course. And basically I was like, in, in my head, I was like, okay, I'm going to try to like film any kind of like when I start going up and down, you know, and flat parts, whatever, we don't need to film that. But like anything I think is interesting as far as like, oh, we're going up a hill now, we're making an aggressive turn. And I was constantly taking out my phone because really there's just no section where you're just kind of dialed in and not thinking. And I talked to Ben Rosario afterwards. For anyone who doesn't know, he's the NAZ uh, coach out in Arizona. And he's elite, sorry. He had a lot of interesting things to say about the course. He thought it was going to be more important than, as far as you need to actually train for this race, you need to train for this course. More important than other marathons in the past where you had to train for the course. Um, it's not something where you can just go do your normal thing and show up on race day and be ready. You really need to throw in some specifics for this race. Uh, and he had some, I think, I think anyone running the trials is going to want to listen to that interview because there were some good tips in there. He thought, you know, you need to be ready for the, obviously you need to be ready for the hills. It's kind of like, you know, getting ready for Boston. You don't do all your, you know, tempos and everything on flat ground if you're training for Boston because you need to be ready for the hills. And this course is just going to be that plus some. So yeah, I think it's, like I said, it's just, it's not going to be a boring course. You know, as a fan, I'm excited. And if I was running this course, I'd be excited because I was not a track guy. I much preferred cross country. So, and this feels much more like that. I think if you're a rhythm runner, if you're really someone who just likes to get in a rhythm and you don't like pace changes and something, you're going to have to kind of start adjusting that in your training and kind of get past that because you're going to be fluctuating a lot in this. Now, Steve, how do you know you weren't being used by Hoka NAZ elite coach Ben Rosero? If I was him, I would give out false information to the masses via the media. I, to be honest, I was actually surprised that he gave so much good advice in the interview. Cause I was like, you know, he's, he's given free, free coaching advice to everyone else. Um, and I thought, personally, I thought it was some very good insights, but, uh, on the other hand, I mean, every coach, you know, who has an athlete towards the top, you know, they're going to be doing their own analysis of the course. So the people who are going to take the advice are probably people who need it. And the people he's most worried about, you know, they already know what's going on. I, I guess it's my take. When it's all said and done, we're going to book Jim Walmsley an automatic spot, right? Non-rhythm runner, hill guy, flag stuff. You know, actually, again, going back to something Ben said, he said, uh, his advice to someone who's not going to see this because I asked him, what's your advice for someone who's not going to come see this course? What should they be doing in their training? And he said, prepare for this race. Like you're preparing for a race that's 30 miles long because it's just going to be, you know, that much, you need that much of a strength uh, background for this course. And that would be perfect for Jim because, uh, you know, he's an ultra guy. So 30 miles, an extra four miles there. Maybe, maybe that makes a difference. Well, and it also sounds like the lesson is everyone, if you're running a full marathon, get that I, uh, that Olympic standard because uh, it's going to be pretty tough to get it on the day in Atlanta. Yeah, I don't think you're setting a PR there. Temperature shouldn't be too much of an issue because it's February. It could be potentially hot, but it shouldn't be too bad. But uh, the course itself is just not really going to be uh, very nice for PRing, I don't think. Well, Steve, thanks for joining us. Please go back into your hole and never be seen in public again unless we tell you to come out. <laughs> Sure thing. Thanks for having me. Good to be part of the podcast. Well, we got to get Weldon back on the podcast. I don't think Weldon's even actually spoken yet. We've been talking for, you know, over 10 minutes. Weldon's going to be headed to the Women's World Cup parade, and he's got to go in about 10 minutes. So, Weldon, welcome to the podcast. What do you want us to talk about quickly before you leave? I'm debating if I should go. Looks like it's starting. Mayor de Blasio is known for starting stuff very late. Looks like this thing might be starting on time. Um, well, I thought a couple interesting things. One, I listened to the Evan Jager thing. I think it's great. You guys want to listen to that at the end. But uh, then halfway through it, I'm kind of like, wait, why is Jager giving this interview to us? He hasn't given an interview essentially in a year. Now, maybe a lot of people haven't reached out. But he's very detailed about his training, his comeback from injuries. It made me feel better as a runner. I used to sort of look back at my career, and I had this foot injury, and I couldn't diagnose it. And Jager just talks about the frustration. And I'm like, wow, a guy with – all of these resources couldn't figure out what it was and just sort of kept struggling. And it took like six to nine months, whatever, to kind of figure out what his injury was. So I think the struggle that we all have with injuries and not knowing what's going on, it's universal. 
even if you got the resources uh, and the best doctors of Nike at your disposal. I just want to mention that real quickly. John did not an- ask the big questions to Jager. Jager, halfway through the podcast, he's talking about how he's cross-training three hours a day. John's like, how are you staying sane? He's like, well, when I was a bike or elliptical, I would listen to podcasts. I mean, it's just, it's just teed up right there, John, to ask if he listens to our podcast. Now, maybe John was afraid him, to hear him say, like, your podcast sucks. I've never listened to it. And then Jager did say, well, I got kind of bored podcast, so I started listening to music or something. Well, clearly, if he's bored of the podcast, he's not listening to our podcast. But what if he had said like he listens to a rival podcast? Like, are there other track and field podcasts out there? Well, I guess we could have deleted that out of the interview. <laughs> Just be like, you know, the some sort of state autocrat who deletes any unfavorable news. Oh, I listened to the Let's Run Track Talk podcast. <laughs> Just insert that into the interview. I got that idea because I watched Icarus last night. Guys, we should have a podcast just about that. I finally watched it. I'm blown away. 2017 says hello, Robert. What have you been eating? Two years? You didn't watch Icarus for two years? I felt like I already knew what happened. But my, my wife watched it and was like outraged by the Russians and everything. So. I decided to watch it myself. Also, real quickly, I've been saying that we would have a political segment. We have Eric the Web Guy. We brought Steve on the podcast today. Eric the Web Guy is in Iowa. I said he's very astute about what's going on in politics here, there, you know, the Iowa caucuses. Did you guys know that Eric sat next to Barry Sand? excuse me, Barry Sanders? <laughs> <laughs> Barry Sanders, really, the uh, Hall of Fame running back. That's interesting. Greatest running back. That'd be more impressive. But he sat next to Bernie Sanders in a meeting last weekend. I just assume everyone in Iowa runs into a political candidate at some point. So it doesn't totally surprise me. But Bernie's obviously one of the big ones. So it's pretty cool. So maybe we'll have Eric on next week and have him tell us about that. My first question was, I'm like, is he too old? And Eric said, no, he's, you know, he was asking good questions. But Eric's the guy, the guy behind the Let's Run.com shoe site. And visitors, you guys, you, you did great this week. We've sort of made the formal launch and push for shoe reviews. And we got nearly 1,000 reviews in the last week. So keep it up. And if you're looking for a new pair of shoes, go to Let's Run.com slash shoes. And before I go, I think a few minutes, because you guys can break down the action as good as I can. Let's talk about a really sad thing that happened this past week. And that was the death of Frank Meza. For those of you guys who don't know, Frank was a 70 plus masters runner. He ran, I think two fifty three in the marathon, which would have been a, I think a 70 plus record. I mean, the course wasn't record eligible, but these are like world record times for his age. And then the evidence became pretty clear that he was cheating on the courses. And there was a huge thread discussing this on Let's Run. Then there was articles published on Marathon Investigation. And this thread started out praising Frank. And then people, when he ran the time, I think back in February, and then it sort of devolved. People were like, hey, like I don't see the splits don't add up. And from people who run, it became quick, pretty apparent, I think, that he, the possibility that he cheated. And then it was pretty certain that he cheated. But he wasn't disqualified until this past week. And unfortunately, he then took his life I mean, it's so sad. I mean, running's not worth it. Nothing's not worth it. And then there's this whole subsequent discussion that Let's Run's responsible for his death. I don't agree with that at all. I'm totally fine with a national record being discussed. I don't want people harassing Frank, you know, going after his employer. I'm fine with people sort of saying like, hey, someone should contact the school he's coaching at. A guy like this shouldn't be coaching. I think that's fair game. And it's brought about a discussion how we can best moderate. But I mean, this story took off. He was in Good Morning America. This is before he died. Inside Edition went to his house and like knocked on the door. I think that sort of gotcha journalism isn't necessary at all for something like this. But I don't know. What are your guys' thoughts on this sad incident? Well, I think it's very sad. I mean, this is a guy that had accomplished a lot in his life, was a pillar of the of the Latino community in Los Angeles, had been a volunteer coach for a number of years, a 70-year-old doctor beloved by his family. I mean, but, but, but I, I want to correct a few things. You said it became pretty apparent and stuff like this. No, no. The guy had already cheated. He was a marathon cheat. And I think that was part of the problem. There was de- the LA Times came out with an article a few weeks ago, and they were debating, is this guy a cheat? And that just made it get bigger and bigger and bigger. He'd already been disqualified by, by the Cal International Marathon and banned from the race on two different occasions. Um, and then there's 
LA could have disqualified him from 2015 for his obviously splits. Nobody runs a 250 marathon with a six minute mile, a nine minute mile, a six minute mile. That just doesn't happen. So he could have been disqualified a long time ago and we would have never gotten to this point. Um, the family sort of blaming, honestly, the online bullies, but Frank was given several chances, uh, so many chances to come clean and he just didn't do it. So yes, the moderation can be improved. We can all learn from this. And I think we should always remember we are talking about real people, but when, when I don't know, I, I think the reason why this, thing was going viral was it was so frustrating to, to diehard runners. I looked at that thread. The LA Times article reporter called me a few weeks ago and said, if you looked at this, I said, no, but generally I'll look at these threads. I'll, I'll spend five minutes on you and tell you whether this guy's a cheat or not. And he was that quick to me. I'm like, this guy's obviously a marathon cheat. Yet there was people, even runners, like some people, I think the head coach at, at the high school that he volunteered at was defending him, which it's like we have evidence that the earth is round and people keep insisting it's flat. And even after his death, his family's – do you talk about Inside Edition? They went on Inside Edition. So they're blaming the online bullies, but they're not they're not upset by the TV cameras coming to their house. And now they're going on there, and they're still in denial. I guess it's their beloved husband, but they're saying he he ran these races. No, he did not. So I, I don't know. Like when, when you don't – it's very frustrating because I, I, I don't know. I, I, I guess – Yes, if the internet didn't exist, would Frank Meza still be alive? I think he would be. But does that mean that we should get rid of the internet or that the internet shouldn't do its job? No, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that it's just a tragedy. I mean, I think that if you're, you're mentally ill, if you if you've, if you've cheat, you're that successful in your life and you're cheating in marathons, I think something's not right in your head. So maybe it was an illness of some sort, but I, I, it's hard to put it in proper perspective, Jonathan. Yeah, I just think there is... There is a line between calling someone out for a fraudulent achievement, especially if it was a record-breaking one, and online bullying. And I don't know if that line was crossed or how often or where it was crossed. I really haven't followed that story, this story that closely. I read Derek Murphy's articles on Marathon Investigation. It became pretty obvious to me that he was cheating, but I don't know. I, I think, like you said, Robert, you just got to remember that there's a real person on the other end who may be reading this stuff. I think Frank's death is, it's very unfortunate. Uh, it's, it's very sad. Um, I'm sure we all have some sympathy for his, his family and his loved ones that they have to go through this. And it would have been nice if this whole situation could have been avoided somehow, but it's tough. I mean, do you want to just ignore the fact that he was out there cheating and setting records? I don't think that's the right step to take, but I think how this was handled by the online community at large probably could have been handled in a better manner. And we're open to suggestions. If you guys ever want to reach out, let's run at let's run.com. If you have any ideas on how, what we could do better or anything like that, we're, we're open to hearing them. Or give us a call 844-538-7786. That's 844. Let's run. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, one thing that people talk about, you know, if you could quietly disqualify him. The problem with this is, and I've talked to Derek Murphy on the phone about this, is if there's no publicity for someone's disqualification, it just keeps happening over and over. There was some triathlete that, like, cheated literally in, like, I think over 50 races because there's no database. So they kind of – there almost needs to be, like, a WADA or some sort of, like, ban. Like, if you get disqualified from a race for cheating – there's a national database or an international database so that people could, you know, race directors could check their entries against that because otherwise people are just going to keep doing it over and over. But we got a lot to go to since we had the 50 minute um, Jager interview at the end, we got to get ready for Monaco on Friday, but let's talk about what happened last week. But before we do, we're going to let us say something before it hits the world cup parade. Yeah, I got to jump off here. I don't know if I'm going to make it, but John, you've been to a lot of victory parades or seen them. Is it common for the politicians to be on the floats as well? Now I think I see why this stuff happens. I saw the mayor on a float, and now I see the governor on a different float with the team. I don't remember that. I think maybe, I think they sometimes show up at the at City Hall at the end during the rally. But I mean, to be honest, we've had so many in Boston. I think the politicians probably just get tired of showing up. It's like, oh, the Patriots won another Super Bowl. We'll just. We'll watch it because they always end at City Hall. So maybe they just watch it from the. This should be like a campaign expenditure for de Blasio's presidential campaign. People actually can actually see him now. It's great exposure. You know, you say, oh. He's on the float. 
I just figured they'd sit, show up at City Hall and he would like give them a proclamation. But like the dude's on the float. All right, guys, I'm out of here. Good luck with the podcast. I want to know, will Bernard Lagat make the Olympic marathon team? Discuss that as well. Bye. All right, guys. I guess, John, that's where we go next. Bernard Lagat. Speaking of, since we talked about Peachtree, Bernard Lagat won Peachtree last year, right? At age 43, when it was a U.S. only race. This year, he skips Peachtree and runs the Gold Coast Marathon in Australia at age 44. Went into the race having won, run one career marathon at 217.20, I think. Takes more than five minutes off his PR, John, which is really good. But runs 212.10 at age 44 to break Memphis Masters record and gets seventh overall. I mean, how surprised were you by that? Remember, this is, I think, the second fastest 1500 man in history now running a 212 marathon. Yeah, I mean, if you had told me before the race he ran 212, I would have been surprised, but not massively so. Because, again, he's flying all the way out to Australia to run an IAF gold label marathon. I mean, if he thinks, if he's committing to do this and he's actually running the event, I don't think he's just going for fun. I assumed he would be going to race it and try to hit the Olympic standard. The surprise to me was, so I was doing, I was watching some of this race online. They had a free stream. And I had my Jager interview scheduled for that that evening, like midway through the race. And when I went to take the call, I was looking at the live splits and Bernard Lagarde was on like 2.13, 20 pace or something. He was not with the lead pack. And I was just thinking, oh man, this could be rough for Bernard. You know, he's, I doubt he wanted to run 2.13 and he was probably slowing down. And then... I finished the interview and I look at the results and it says 2.12.10. And that really did blow me away that he negative split this race. Just really, really impressive running. 44 years old. He's now, he's clearly a threat to make the Olympic team. I mean, you asked him, Robert, after the race, will you be running the trials? And he didn't commit to it. But if you look at, how do you not run the trials at this point? Yeah, I was shocked that he didn't commit to running the trials. I mean, why else would you go to the Gold Coast unless you were trying to potentially get the A standard? Um, so I think he's got to do the trials. I mean, I guess there might be more money if he runs in New York. I mean, it was kind of interesting when they did the Gold Coast in the first place, John. I mean, you think you get more money as an American going to Boston or maybe Chicago. I mean, Chicago particularly. I know his agent, James Templeton, right? He has some connections over to Australia and stuff like that. So maybe that explained it. But, I mean, where does he rank in terms of the entrance? I mean, you've got Galen Rupp, Olak, if he's healthy. Then you've got Jared Ward and Scott Fable at 209, right? But then, I mean, who's next on the list uh, on the list of U.S. marathoners in terms of time? Yeah, I mean, I don't know time-wise, but you think of guys like Shadrach B. Watt has been top five in a bunch of majors. He's up there. Dathan Ritzenheim, if he can ever get healthy. You know, his running Boston this spring wasn't great, but Abdi's getting up there in age. I mean, Lagat is he's in the conversation for sure, especially if one of the, I do think there's a fairly clear cut top three at this point. You've got Rupp in his own tier. You've got Fable and Ward as the two next guys. And then after that, it's something of a free for all, but yeah, I, I, it, he's in the mix for sure. And his ranking, you pointed out in the week that was Robert, his ranking points are going to be going way up with this time because he also gets bonus points because gold coast was an IAF gold label race. So he should be in position to get a bid if he can finish in the top three in Atlanta. Now, that's a, obviously not easy. He'll be 45 years old. And it's a hilly, tough course. But if it goes really slow, I mean, it's, it's just exciting. It adds another layer of intrigue to what is already a very intriguing race. Yeah, I'm looking at the, at the U.S. list. I mean, I think until it's job shot, they ignore Boston, I guess, because it's aided. But, you know, last year, nobody ran – Galen Rupp ran 206 – twice and then Jared Ward ran 212.24 and then this year you know ignoring Boston Andrew Colley 212.15 so I, I think he certainly has a shot I, I if, if you made me predict I would say you know, it's like anything you're picking the field against him I'm saying no I mean I, I think that he's not as good as Jared Ward he's not as good as Fobble he's not as good as Rupp and then there's probably a number of other guys. I don't think he's as good as Boyd. And then there's probably another, another bunch of other guys that, yeah, there's a lot of 212 guys in there. You know, maybe there's 8 to 10, 212 type kid guys. So that would be interesting. Um, but the interesting thing to me, John, is I, I reached out to him via Twitter, did a quick q and I said, what was the difference? And he's like, look, my coach made me, Coach Lee, James Lee, made me run every workout 
particularly the long runs on the pavement. You know, I guess in his normal career, he's running on soft surfaces, on, on trails out, out in Arizona. And the marathon, you got to get used to that pounding. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Well, you got to be used to it, especially he needs to, if he's going to run Atlanta, he needs to be used to the pounding. He needs to be used to the hills. I don't know what Tucson is like for hills, but you know, you got to prep as Ben Rosario said, you got to prep for that course specifically. So we'll be very exciting to see how Bernard Lagat handles the trials. That will be one of the stories is 45 going for his sixth Olympic team. That's crazy. He got the bronze medal in the 1500 meters in Sydney running for Kenya. And in 2020, he could be running 20 years later. He could be running the marathon for the United States. That would be pretty incredible. John, you, you, you follow him on Instagram or Twitter. He had some posts though, which is fascinating because a lot of people know his, his one brother, Robert Cesare, who was a multi-time NCAA champion. But Lagat said on that tweet that I think he now he's got two other brothers that have beaten have better marathon PRs than him, but they've all run two twelve. So he's run two twelve ten, but he's the third member of the family. Is that correct? That was news to me, but he, yeah, he tweeted that out. He's also got a very fast sister, Viola Lagat, who's a middle distance runner. So that's clearly if you did like a scored cross country meet, that might be the family that that does the best. The Ingebrigtsens are already obviously pretty good, but this the Lagat family or Bernard's family just rolls very very deep so that was gold coast let's talk a- i'm looking at brother one nathan nathan lagat has run 21208 william 21209 and then bernard 21210 how weird is that three brothers in the same family and they've run within <laughs> two seconds of each other in the marathon with their prs yeah it's it's wild it's totally wild but let's move on. Let's talk a little bit briefly about Lausanne and then we can look forward to Monaco because what's, I mean, there were a few things that really stood out to me from Lausanne. And one was the 5K with Hago Skeberwet kicking a lap early. Now, this is something that, you know, a lot of great runners have done in our sport from time to time. It's obviously embarrassing. Jenny Simpson did it once at the New Balance Indoor Grand Prix. Lopez Lemong did it at Peyton Jordan one year. Kenny Sabakele did it indoors, it was pointed out to me back in uh, 2005. I, also in Boston, but Hago Skeberwet did this, and the craziest thing that happened, so last night I was out to dinner with some of my friends, and I was talking to them about my week and what I was doing, and then one of them says, oh yeah, did you see this 5K? This guy, he he, he ran a lap early, you know, he thought he finished, and I was like, this is a guy who knows nothing about running, who never normally cares about running, but this story clearly went viral, He and I told him, I'm like, yeah, it's Hagros Gebrewet. He's the Olympic bronze medalist. And he's like, yeah, it was unbelievable. So that's how you go mainstream, people. Everyone just has to kick a lap early in the distance races. Hmm. It is interesting what goes viral and what doesn't. I mean, what didn't go viral was Noah Lyles running 1950 to become the fourth fastest human of all time in the 200 meters. I mean, that's really the the most impressive performance of the day. But... You know, people, 1950, what does that mean to people? Unless it's a world record, not much. Uh, kicking a lap early, everyone can sort of relate to that. But 1950, really, really good. I mean, Lyles, he's out there in lane seven, which is his preferred lane. And what I noticed was he just got a really good start. Uh, and that is sort of something he's been working on. And he got a great start. And then by coming off the turn, he just totally pulled away from everyone. I mean, that guy, when he hits top gear, it's just game over. And... To run that fast, really, really, really impressive stuff by Noah. And the interesting thing now is he runs the 100 in Monaco on Friday. And it's going to be a really intriguing race. There's no Christian Coleman, but there's Noah Lyles. There's Justin Gatlin, who ran 987 at Prefontaine. And then there's Divine Oduduru, the NCAA champion from Texas Tech and Nigeria, who ran 986 at NCAAs. So they're all entered together. And Lyles, when I spoke to him in Boston, he said, He's still planning on only doing the 200 at USA's and Worlds, but if he dropped a bomb in the 100, that was his phrasing, he would have to consider doing the double. And drop. I asked him, what does that mean? And he said about 9.75. So I don't know if he can go 9.75 in Monaco, but the, with the way his start looked in Lausanne and how fast he ran in the 200, I think he could go sub 9.8 and, and maybe things get interesting there. But he's going to be tested. Gatlin and Odaduru are no joke. So I think that might be the the race of the day in Monaco on Friday. I was going to ask, like, how does he not drop a bomb? I mean, only four men have run 1950. I guess Michael Johnson wasn't, Michael Johnson's one of them and he's never run nine, seven. So 
Um, the uh, you know uh, Usain Bolt obviously has run really fast at 100 meters, and and then um, the other guy is, is Johan Blake. You know, and, and Johan's you know it's weird. The th- th- of the three guys faster than Noah, two of them are absolute legends. Johan, Johan sort of had that injury and has never been quite the same, but he does have a 969 you know 100 meter PR. That's from 2000. 12, which is the year after that he ran 1926. People forget that. Johan Blake ran 1926, and he's only, what, 0.07 off, off Usain Bolt's world record. Um, and, and the year that he ran that 969, he was a 1944 guy. So, I, I, John, I think he definitely runs. I mean, he's already run 985. 986 six? this year. Well, definitely sub 9.8. I don't know. We can. I mean, you, it depends on the wind. Depend, the conditions, I assume, will be nice in Monaco. I'm not going to say definitely sub nine eight, but I think he's got a good shot to do it. But he, here's the here's the question, Robert. I know as fans of the sport, we want to see him run the hundred and two hundred. Addo Bolden essentially called him out on Twitter. He's like, "You need to take up the challenge, Noah. Run the hundred and two hundred. The, the two hundred gold is already yours." But if you're his coach, would you want him at 21 years old? He's going to turn 22. Uh, next week i think would you want him trying this he's never run a world's or olympics would you want him to try the double or would you say just run the 200 and then focus on the double next year in tokyo well uh, if i was the coach i'd want to look at the schedule i mean there's more it's easier to do the double right at the trials because there's more time i'm talking particularly the u.s trials no i mean the olympic trial the u.s trials it's harder to do it for worlds because it's a four-day meet as opposed to uh a- no that's what i'm saying it's easier to do the double at usa's in an olympic year because the olympic trials are spread out over a full week whereas Correct. usa's this year are only like three or four days so while you have to run more rounds of the trials you have a lot more time so do we i mean i'm assuming you'd have to run the 100 200 on the same day during the usa's at some point I don't, I don't know about that. I haven't looked up the specific schedule. I mean, all right, and here, here's also, here's the super gamble, is you run the 100 only at USA's, and then you win the Diamond League final and get your way in. Because honestly, who's beating him in the Diamond League final? No one. But it's a risk, because obviously if something goes wrong, then you don't get to run the 200 at World. So he's going to run the 200 at USA's. I love that plan. I love that plan, John. That's, I don't want to get him injured. And I don't know. If, I don't know if Johan Blake being that good. If he got, in, are you more likely to get injured because you double? I mean, I I don't know. You know, I was reading some thread about where some high school runner would go to college. Someone's like, I hope they don't go somewhere where they double them all the time for points. It ruins their career. I'm thinking, Galen Rupp tripled at NCAs, didn't ruin his career. So maybe it has nothing to do with it. But John, I love that idea. I love everything outside the box. So you know, because I, I I was thinking like. Oh, does he automatically get in as a world champion? But he's not the world champion. So, yes, Diamond League winner. That's a good plan. Let's do that, Noah. That would be really ballsy, too. It, it would be. I mean, how exciting would that race be, though? Like, knowing going into the Diamond League final, knowing he has to win or else he doesn't get to run it at Worlds. John, put me in timeout. I don't like using that term that I just used that starts with a B to use masculine. There's nothing admirable about a man's balls. I apologize. For that, um, trying to be better with my words, but yeah, so th- you know that uh, that's fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about the distance races there, and we want to talk about the sunset tour meet that was last night because Monaco. Some people may, when they listen to this podcast, it may have already happened. But John, in the in the fifteen hundred, I mean, it was a, a really fast race. Six guys at three thirty one or faster, led of course by Chariot, three twenty eight. I mean, he dominated like he always does. I mean, he was up by so much heading into the last lap. I mean, he didn't have the fastest last lap. So since he's winning everything, is he unbeatable at Worlds? Or are you a little bit nervous that the Ingebrigtsen's had a much bigger last lap, he's not going to have a rabbit at Worlds, and he's not used to running tactical races? I mean, this guy's never run like a slow race. You know, it's not like he's a guy that's coming up in the U.S. system where he's used to running tactical conference 1,500 meters. Right. You pointed this out in your post-race recap, Robert, and then I- I'm like, did you watch the 2017 World Championship final? Do you remember what him and Manningoy did to that field? He just decided there wasn't a rabbit in that race, but his coach just told him, open up a gap, and that's what he did. He gapped everyone. He, he got blown. Manningoy blew by him at the end because Manningoy's really fit, but Manningoy is clearly not the same guy right now. He's been sort of banged up. If he shows up, if they ran the World Championship final today, I think... Chariot would just be doing 
do what he's been doing in the Diamond Leagues. He'd make it really fast, he'd get a gap on these people, and then he'd blow them away over the last lap. He'd be too far in front. But the World Championship final isn't today. It's in October. And Chariot is now taking on another race. He wasn't initially going to run Monaco, and now he's entered in Monaco. So I'll be interested to see how fast he goes there. But no, I don't think he's invincible. No one's ever invincible. And you look at how the Ingebrigtsons have been running. Jake Jakob, I'm really impressed with just how how he knows his body and his his tactical savvy, I think, is exceptional for someone who's only 18 years old. He, if, if Chariot, I mean, if Chariot's just way fitter than everyone else, I think he still wins at Worlds. He's got to maintain this level of fitness. But if, he's, if he makes a mistake or if these other guys get fitter, you know, I think Jakob's in the mix. I think Centrowitz is, I'm not counting him out. I mean, Centro, from what I've seen so far, you're M146. He didn't, he kind of got smoked by Bryce Opel and Craig Engels last night in the 800. But he's shown exactly what I would want to see from him coming back from injury. I think if he continues, gets another two months of good training, he's going to be a metal threat again. Engels has been running really well. I mean, I'm not going to call, I'm not going to say Craig Engels is going to win Worlds, but Craig Engels has been running. I mean, he ran 144 last night and he, he looked great at pre. I mean, Engels could be a metal threat, assuming he makes the team. But Chari- no, I'm not going to say Chariot's unbeatable, but he's def- he has to be the favorite because I think he can pull away from people even without a rabbit. I mean, looking at the descending order list, in 2017, though, John, he had over two and a half, over 2.2 seconds over the next fastest person, ignoring Managoy in that field. Whereas this year, he's only, you know, he's only one point. Just under 1.39 seconds ahead of Ingebrigtsen. It's still pretty big. We'll see how he does in Monaco. I mean, what if he drops a 327 in Monaco? Would you, would that change your mind? Well, no, I think he should win. And if I was him, I wouldn't be that panicked about it. I don't think he needs to go out and run a 328 from the start. I think he could just... I would I would like to wait a little bit and just slam it home from maybe 1,000 out. That's basically what he did in London. Yeah, I think the winning time was like three thirty-two or something. So just follow that game plan. I mean, that's I've written it in our articles. But you can't play defense in a fifteen hundred meters. If someone is just able to go from farther out than you are and harder than you are, you you can't be any sort of tactical nous nous n o u s is that how you I think nous I don't know any sort of tactical strategy. It can't overcome that if the guy's just way way fitter than you. Yeah, I don't think you even need to throw in a. The- Gap them. You could just slowly grind it down. I think it's safer that way. Yeah. You know, just tighten the screws as you go along. Let's talk a little bit about the Ethiopian team, John. I mean, Kajelcha went, Hagos kicks early, Kajelcha wins. He looks so good. But do we even know if he's going to make the 1500 meter team? I mean, Ethiopia is so stacked. I mean, they've got Mutar Edris, who's the defending champion. So he could be in. Even though he's running terrible, I think he ran like thirteen twenty nine was like last in that race or something like it. He, if he gets the wild card, there's only three spots left. Well, if you look at the world list, so here's the twenty nineteen world list. Number one, Telahun Bekele, Ethiopia, twelve fifty two. Number two, Salomon Borega, Ethiopia, twelve fifty three. Number three, Hagos Gebrewet, Ethiopia, twelve fifty four. Number five, Abadi Hadis, Ethiopia, twelve fifty six. So that's a list that doesn't include the guy who has the buy right now. Um, Muktai Idris, the world champ. And it doesn't include Yomif Kajelcha, who has won the two Diamond Leagues that he's run this year. And Robert, you had a proposal in the week that was that if Ethiopia, if they have someone win the Diamond League final, they should use the buy on that individual as opposed to Muktai Idris, because you can only use the buy on one. You can't send any more than four, even if you have two people eligible for buys. And I, I agree with that thinking. I think Idris... Needs, I know he's the world champion, and I know you want to see that guy defend his title if he can, but if these guys have just consistently been way better than him on the circuit, I think you have to take them over him. I think right now it would be foolish for the Ethiopian Federation to leave Kajelcher off the team because I think he's, you know, I just think he's better than, well, but I mean, Selma Breger and Telekun Bekele has been running well. I, I do think he's better than Gebrewat, though. Now, isn't the 10,000 second this year for some reason? Yes, the 10,000 is on the final day of the meet. Okay, here I've got the I've got the solution here. First of all, I didn't realize. I mean, Kajelcha dominated that race. Now I know Haggis kicked early, but I didn't realize Telehum Highway and Selman Brega, who've run 1252 and twelve fifty three, were both in that race last week. So you've got to put Kajelcha on the team. I mean, he beat them by a lot. So he, while he hasn't run the fast time, he's got a sick kick. But I think Haggis, you know, he's young twenty seven one. I know I mentioned I, I remember reading interviews. I'm going to do a ten thousand. 
So I, th- I think he just does 10,000 only. And then that opens up a spot. So then you've got Teller. I would do Haile, Berega, Kajelcha. And then you could pick the four spot between. It doesn't really matter. A body hottest. I mean, he's run 1256. Or, or you could do Edris. But, I mean, he was only fifth in Lasan, So it's not like, you know, that, that's what I would do. I think Haggis moves to the 10,000. Because you don't want to run the 5,000 first. If, if the 10,000 is second this year, you know what I'm saying? Stay fresh for the 10,000. I think that's what we'll see. Yeah. Well, it should be uh, should be good. I gotta say, my tenth K pick still Joshua Chet, the guy though. I've been really impressed with how he's been running. I think that guy is gonna take a stranglehold on that event. I'm still mad that Mo is not doing it. Chicago Marathon instead. All right, let's let's look briefly at Monaco before we end this thing. So no, no, no. Sunset Tour, John. Sunset. Oh, Tour. Sunset Tour. All right, all right. What do you want to talk about, Robert? I gotta pull up the results here. So in, in case you missed it, this is kind of like a, uh, I think it's the second year of this race. First uh, Jesse, year. First year. Jesse Williams put it on. It's kind of kind of, kind of becoming like, I guess it's the July version of the USA TF Distance Classic. They had it out in LA last, last night, and a lot of American-based runners were in it chasing the standards. Some really interesting results. I mean, Bryce Hopple to me was this, not the surprise of the day, but – the guy's undefeated for the year, and he stayed undefeated. I mean, 144-48. Um, he beat Craig Ingalls, who ran a big PR. I mean, Craig was fourth in the 19, in the 2016 Olympic Trials in 800. But his PR was only 146. Craig skips from 146 to 144. Very impressive. I know, John, you mentioned earlier Matthew Sintowitz. Um, He was seventh, 146-32. But to me, I'm impressed by that. I mean, that's only that's his best time since he ran his PR in 800 in 2015. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's a good sign for Centro. Uh no, no issues there at all. And I think Bryce, is there any doubt, Robert? I mean, do we do we even hold the eight hundred at USA's? Isn't our team just going to be Brazier Murphy and Bryce Hopple at this point? Yes. I mean, I, I got an argument with somebody on the message board last night. They were talking about Isaiah, Isaiah Harris. I'm like, Isaiah Harris has only run like, I think he's run one forty six, and he missed a lot of time. So why do I think he's going to run one forty four? I I I don't. So I, I you know. I would say Brazier sometimes makes me nor. He used to make me nervous in the past because he didn't run tactically very smart. He was just kind of a one-trick pony. He had to go out fast. But Brazier last night, very impressive. 337 and 1,500. To me, the distance strength of the Nike Oregon Project is coming through for Brazier, and I really think that helps. it's going to help him in the rounds and also help him be more confident. I've always thought the 800, when I was coaching, people used to think that a slow 800 benefited like fast people, I'm like, no, it's just the opposite. If it's tactical, it benefits the people who are the strongest. If they're jogging around for 600 meters, you've got to be able to change gears and that comes to endurance. So I think now he'll be able to handle any type of race. He should not be nervous. Alberto tells him just in the first round, just, just, you don't need to run fast. Just wait and blast everybody in the last 150, 250. You know, I was very impressed by that 337. Yeah, no, he was just mowing people down, and probably Pete Julian will tell him that because Pete's the one who handles Donovan's training. But yeah, he I, I, he's been exceptional. He's a world leader in the eight hundred. He three thirty seven is terrific. Clearly, he's got some endurance. Their, their endurance training's been working at OP, so that was really good for him. And, and my big takeaway there, though, John, is who he beat. He beat Drew Hunter, and we've been hearing this talk. And Drew's been running the fifteen hundred for years. He's kind of going on the rut plan, like work on the speed, work on the speed, work on the speed. I never paid any attention to him in the 1500. His coach, Tim Men, in high school said, look, this guy's more like Craig Virgin. He, he's a 5K guy, and you know he's a distance runner, and he's been going back and forth. What should I do? Well, if he doesn't have the standard, which he doesn't have right now, there's no question. He needs to run the 5,000. He's got the 5,000 standard. He doesn't have the 1,500-meter standard. Now, there's still a couple weeks left if he can get the 1,500-meter standard, but I don't think he's making that team at 1,500. I think this proves it. This, if he's smart, pushes him to the 5,000 at USA's. Yeah, no, he told me in Boston if he didn't have the standard, he had to do the 5K, and uh, I don't think he's going to get the standard, so I think that's pretty obvious. And the 1,500 team is going to be, I mean, they're, they're all, all these USA teams are going to be tough to beat, tough to make, but Centro and Engels, I think, have two spots on lock in that event, so it's really one, one of them open. Or at least the way Engels, the way I think about it is Engels' fitness is on another level right now than the rest of the guys in the 1,500 in the USA. I think for him to miss the team would be would be up to a tactical mistake. I do think Centro can get to that level by USA's. But some of these other events, I mean, I think some of them, some of the guys have to be disappointed by not getting these standards. I mean, the winning time in the 
1500 was 336.2. So no one got the standard there, even though some of the top guys already had it. But Drew Hunter didn't get it. The winning time in the men's 5000 was only 1325. And really, that they let that slide from 2200 meters to 3800 meters. They ran 427, which is like 1354 pace. No one took it up once the rabbit left. And that, that meant that you have guys like Lopez Lamont. I mean, Lopez is probably just going to do the 10K, I assume, at USA's. But, you know, Grant Fisher, Woody Kincaid, these guys are missing out on the standard because no one wanted to step up. And at some point, someone has to take control of that race and just say, screw it. It doesn't matter if you win. Who cares if you get blown by for third in this meet? The time is all that matters at this meet. I agree, but somebody like Woody Kincaid or Grant Fisher is probably hoping to get some be pulled along to that time. I was shocked that Hassan made him. He'd run thirteen. He'd just missed the standard in Shanghai. But the thing is, John, may I looked it up this morning. He's got the NACAC championship, so right. he's got the standard there. Lopez has the NACAC championship in ten thousand. He has a standard. So the two best guys in that field didn't really need the standard. So I guess they didn't really want to. I don't know why the coaches wouldn't just make them push the pace for everybody else, but disappointing to me i mean grant fisher i know it's like a half a second pr but that was disappointing to me well did you see in that race grant fisher essentially centro was like grant fisher's personal rabbit in that race it was really weird like centro was pacing he dropped out like halfway through but instead of going right to the front he sort of sat in the middle of the pack in front of grant but it's not like he was doing anything that grant Grant could have just followed the other guys behind so i'm not really sure what the game plan was there but no one, no one ran fast enough, or at least Grant Fisher didn't run fast enough to get in contention for the team. No, John, I did not watch the race. Again, I was watching Icarus last night. I'm not going to pay $30 to watch some race when all I need to see is the results. But um, to, to me, one of the more interesting results, well, the Bowman Track Club women did very well. They went 1-2 in 800. Shelby Houlihan gets under two minutes for the first time. She loses to Kate Grace. But this really became interesting to me when I started looking at these results and analyzing them. I'm like, Kate Grace is ranked fourth in the U.S. in both the 800 and the 1500. I know she's been trying to move up to the 1500, but if I'm her, I I, I don't do the 1500 at USA's. I, I drop back to the eight. I, I think that, you know, she's fourth in both. I think that if she makes the team in the eight, she's got a much better chance at meddling. If you throw out Castro's Dominion and all the X Y women. If, if you if you look at Kay Grace's PR, she'd be the fastest woman in the world this year. And Lauren Castro, Simeon, and Fancy Nassaba, who may not be at Worlds. So she could theoretically be right in there for a big medal. Yeah, Robert, I, I think this is an excellent point you made uh, in your recap. Because think of it this way. So Kay Grace, she, was, she made the 2016 Olympic final. I think she finished lost in that race. Sorry, Kate, if, uh, if that wasn't the case. But you take out the top three, that's fifth. And the top three, right now, only two of them can compete. I guess the risk you take here is this Swiss Federal Tribunal decision may not come till after USA's, and so you're sort of taking a risk. But if I look at the medal pe- threats in the 1500, you've got Gonzebe de Barba, you've got Laura Muir, you've got Shelby Houlihan, you have Jenny Simpson. I mean, Kate would only be, she'd be struggling to medal at USA's. To get third at USA's is not a lot. To get third at Worlds would be really tough, whereas USA is if she makes the team in the 800, I do agree. She's She could become a medal threat at world. So Yeah, she, I don't see how she medals in the 1500. She's 20th in the world right now. I mean, she's 11th in the, in the 800. I think the right call there, you know, is the uh, 800. Women's 1500, Nikki Hiltz wins again. Disappointing, um, you know, well, she won by a lot, by over a second. I mean, she wasn't disappointing, but no, nobody else really – some of the people who have the standard didn't really run well in that race. Danny Jones, I bet you would have expected more out of her, Robert. Yeah, 409. Um, so you've got that. I mean, w- one thing that struck me there is, I mean, uh, we're talking about Bowman Track Club going 1-2 in the 800. In the 1500, Colin quickly gets second. I mean, 407, that's kind of what, I mean, not a surprise there. But Courtney Fredericks, she's in the B heat of the 1500. Yeah, I don't she, get that. This is the second time this year she, the, the World Silver Medalist has run, had to run the B heat. She's not that great at the 500, but she ran a PR. And from 414, she comes down to 411, which is nice. And then we move up to the 5,000. The BTC women, they go one, two, three, and all three of them um, PR. Uh, Carissa Schweizer ran 1501. Um, Muriel Hall, 1502. And Vanessa Fraser, 1507. And all three get the Olympic standard as well. So that's really important to get that out of the way because uh, 
you know, now you don't have to run these silly indoor meets at BU instead of skipping USA. So you can actually just run USA indoors. So that's great. What's interesting to me, John, is who's going to get the, 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 the f- third spot there in the women's 5,000 at USA's. I mean, I, I think that for some dumb reason, the 1,500, 5,000 double for women is impossible at Worlds. I think the finals are 30 minutes apart. So American record holder Shelby Houlihan is going to be not running that race. So it's going to be a lot easier to make that team than it might be in the Olympics if she decides to double. I think Schweizer at 1,501 is pretty safe. Mary Hall, I'd be surprised if she doesn't make it at 1,502. But then you've got you know four other women between 1505 and 1508, Kim Conley, Rachel Snyder, Vanessa Frazier, Eleanor Perrier. So uh, I can see a scenario, John, where, where Houlihan runs, so then you're down to the fourth person making it. And even Perrier, she could make the 1500 team. Why not double back for the 5000? The 5000 USAs is the day after 1500. So the double USAs is very doable. Well, what about Mariel Hull in the 10K? I would assume she'd run the 10K. Oh, well, then that makes it a lot easier for one of these women. Well, Hall, you, well, I guess Hall could do the ten and five, and then just run. Well, she probably would do both in the worlds. But anyways, yeah, you can have you can have a scenario like twenty sixteen when Abby Dacasino was what fifth and, and made the team. I mean, you could have a fifth or sixth place or in this event making it. You could, and one woman who we should notice who should note ran this race: Shannon Robbery, fifth place, fifteen twenty four, coming back from giving birth last year. She does not have the world championship standard, so she's got to hope for the fa- the pace to go fast in Des Moines and for her to get in the top three or top six, depends, you know, on who else drops out from this event. But yeah, it's somewhat an intriguing event. None of these women are really going to be global medal threats, but it's going to be interesting to see how it shakes out in the team. I, I think Schweizer probably the favorite unless Houlihan decides to run and, you know, Houlihan would be the favorite there. So let's look ahead. That That's sort of the Sunset Tour wrap. USA's is coming in a few weeks. So we have Monaco on Friday. I don't know if the meet has happened after you're listening to the podcast or before you listen to the podcast, but it should be a good one. Sydney McLaughlin in the 400 hurdles. That'll be fun. Non-Diamond League 800 in the women's side. RJ Wilson will be heavily favored there. We've got the 1500. That meet always produces fireworks. I'm a little curious. I mean, most of these guys, Timothy Chariot, the Ingebrigtsen brothers, Aliane Suleiman, Sel- Sel- Samuel Tefera, they ran fast in Lausanne last week, so I don't know if they're going to be able to go fast again, but my guess is Chariot's going to be targeting a really fast time. If he, He's a late addition to Monaco. I think he might, you know, we could see it t- attempt at the world record. Why else would he just uh, join this race? He's already won. It's not a Diamond League 1500. Oh, I'm fascinated by that. I mean, we, we normally, I, normally, to me, I get excited for Monaco every year for one reason, the men's 1500. And this year we've already run fast. So I was like, are they going to have a good field? Kiprop's a doper. He's gone. There's no Manningoy. But to hear these guys are in it, I'm really excited to see what they can do. It'll give us more of a take on what we might see at Worlds. Is he? I mean, he he's won over 90% of his, of his Diamond League races, you know, dating back to, I think, 10 of 11 or 9 of 10. It's pretty amazing. So that is going to be, you know, pretty amazing. And then we're going to run the women's mile, John. And I, I see that your notes are you're asking, could the women's mile world record go down? We got Gonzebe de Baba, Safan Hassan, both are entered. Now, the women's world record race, 412.56 from yeah. <clears throat> a Russian, Svetlana Mastrakova from 1996. Svetlana, that's how you say that name. How? Why are you even asking this? To me, 412, take away 20 seconds, is 352. No, we're not going to see a 352. Dababa's PR is 414. Hassan's PR is 414. I think Hassan is in the best shape of her life right now. Dababa maybe not, but I think it's I, I think it's on the table. 414, it's not that far to go to 412.56. I think it's possible. I guess we'll agree to disagree there. We'll see how the race goes. That track, I mean, it's always fast. You get a boost. There's not going to be a world record. I mean... Well, I guess you did say, I guess you casually mentioned whether Cherry would go for the world record. So what, the world record in the 1500 is 326 flat, right? I don't think he gets it, but I think he could go after it. He's got to go 2.41 seconds. So they both got to go about, you know, two and a half seconds off, off their their personal best to do it. So no, I, I don't think either happens. Genzebe de Baba went from 354 to 350 in 2015 in Monaco to break the world record. Well, anyways, I have questions about both those world records. That's all I'm going to say. Um. On that front, John, I don't want to get myself. 
I think I know the questions you're hinting at. But anyway, we've got a great men's hundred, as mentioned. Lyles versus Oduduru versus Justin Gallon. Hopefully, Oduduru starts this race. He was supposed to run last week in Lausanne and scratch. So, yeah, I'm interested to see what he does. I mean, Shikari Richardson, the standout women's sprinter from NCAs, has not been near. She when she ran pre was nowhere near her old form. So sometimes these collegians, it's such an emotional peak for NCAs that they can't keep it going. Yeah. And then we got a men's steeple. It's not a great one because there's no Caprudo. There's no Evan Jager. You'll hear why in a few minutes. But there is Hilary Bohr, who came second in Doha earlier this year. Sufyan el Bakali, the guy who beat him there, is also running. Getnet Wale of Ethiopia. He He's the world leader, only 8.06 this year. Benjamin Keegan's in there too. He's run 8.06. So I feel like that race is pretty up for grabs. I mean, I wouldn't... Let's say Hillary Bohr. I mean, if he contends the win here, do you have him as a favorite over Jager at USA's, knowing that Jager has only been running on solid ground since about June 15th? Hmm. I mean, it's hard to bet against Jager, but yes, why would Jager be in 805 shape? If he's been running, I, I think I did the math, it's 40 days from when he's first started running. I mean, I guess you can cross train. To me, also, the, the, John, your, your interview, which we're about to, we're about to play, it shows to me just how big of a talent the, the top guys are. I mean, it's like a bell curve. People don't realize how much the best person is so much better than like, you know, the gap between one and five is so much bigger than the gap between five and 10. Because the idea of, of winning USA's on 40 days of running is absurd to me. So I, I would think that he's an underdog. And the, Walton made a good point, kind of question like, why did Jager give this interview? He doesn't give a lot of interviews. Like, is he... Is it fun to be the underdog? I, I think it is. You know, and, he, and he's also appreciating running more. He's been away from it for so long and had such misery. And, and I think these breaks, I mean, Galen Rupp said the break for him was good. You know, you appreciate what you have. It, it can be monotonous. You know, I, I, one time a kid at Cornell, he wanted to, he was, oh, you know, I can't go out and such a sacrifice. So I let him quit the team. A few months later, he, he came back. I mean, he was like, oh, I guess going out isn't that much fun. So... You know, it, it'll be interesting to see what what happens there. Yeah, I don't think that's how Evan's viewing it. He was like, it was clearly eating at him that he couldn't run or he couldn't run the way he wanted to over the winter and spring. So you'll you'll hear in a minute. But one thing, I think the point you put made there, Robert, about the talent gap is is real because remember, 2017, consensus to Kiprudo, he showed up to Worlds. He'd basically been DNFing his races on the Diamond League circuit. He said he had run one track session since the Kenyan Trials in June showed up to Worlds in August, won the damn thing. He's just that talented. Like, some of these guys, you know, he won the Diamond League final with one shoe on last year. Like, Jager is Jager is a super talent. And if Jager, you know, is to the U.S. steeple ranks, what Kid Cezles Kipruto is to the global steeple ranks, I don't think it would be a surprise to see him win USA's. But, like, Kipruto has essentially the same injury. He's got a talus bone injury. He hasn't run at all in 2019, so he's targeting a return in about August. But, he could just show up and win worlds because he's that talented and he can kick that well. So it's, you know, some of these guys, yeah, if you're, if you're just a mega, mega talent that can supersede months of healthy training sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I think for Caputo and Jager, I mean, 807, 808 is a bad race for them. And the other guys, 807, 808 is like PR shape for them, for most of them. So, you know, Jager's got such good speed. It'll be interesting. He could kind of just sit on, on bore maybe. Keep it close, and he wants that eight in a row would be a record. No one in the U.S. has ever won eight in a row in the steeple. So, you know, and he's not going to have another chance to do it, John. I don't think he's going to be competing in eight more years if he doesn't win it this year. So should be interesting. So, John, good podcast. You and I, I'm sure that the people have noticed the quality has gone up without Weldon. Weldon is at the World Cup. John, sorry for your England team. After the U.S., he's at the parade right now. But after your England team fell to the Mighty Americans, did you at least root for the Americans the rest of the way, or did you root against them? You're, you are a U.S. citizen uh, to, to because they beat your beloved England team. Yeah, I kind of rooted for them, but I just I more wanted to see I wanted to see a competitive final. And the U.S. I mean, I, I'll tip my captain. They were by far the best team in this tournament. And so watching them in the final, I was just like, the Netherlands is not going to score. America is just too good. And so I was a little un- upset. The penalty I thought was fairly soft. I thought it was correctly called, but the penalty that Megan Rapino scored, I was like, I don't want that goal deciding the World Cup final. And then Rose, Rose Lavelle scored a great goal. And I was like, all right, that's that's deserved. So, yeah, I was, I was happy the U.S. Win, the women won. I think the whole celebration thing's totally overblown. I think people, like, they're, they're a fun team to watch and to root for. 
but I was rooting for England. But here's the thing, Robert. I know I was upset. England's got a chance of redemption. Cricket World Cup semi-final tomorrow. England versus Australia. If we win, we're in the final against New Zealand. You know, that's a. I've got another team to root for, but maybe we just lose in the semi-finals like the soccer team has done in recent years. Is this the men's cricket, John, or does, it even, does women's cricket even exist? Women's cricket does exist. Uh, men's cricket is by far more popular, and the World Cup semi-final is on tomorrow as we're recording this. So on Thursday, England versus Australia. Equal pay. Actually, one of the things about the World Cup that drives me nuts is both, both of these politicians jumping on board. It's kind of driving me nuts. I, I think that's crazy. For the celebration, John, here's my theory. I think the Rapino, like 10th goal celebration was absurd. That was the one that really bothered me. But the rest, here, here, here's my comparison. What do you think about this analogy? To me, and I thought this at the time, I'm like, you know what? Like these women just don't give an F what other people think about it. They're ruthless. They, they're here to kick ass and just destroy this tournament. And they did. I mean, they, they didn't even trail in every game except for one. I think they scored in the first 15 minutes. I agree with you in the final. It'd be nice to see them like fall behind just with some fluke, just to see what they could do under pressure. But to me, what about this? They remind me kind of of the Nike Oregon project. Anyone that joins the Nike Oregon project in the last couple of years just doesn't give an F. All they want to do is win. They don't care what the, the public perception of you is. Like, why would you join a group with a, with a head coach who's under doping suspicion? But, hey, you know, you join it because you want to win and you think, A, it's either bogus or B, I won't do drugs. Or, or C, yeah, hey, I will do drugs and we won't get caught. So any of those three options, I guess, are the options. But – I think at some level, you have to be kind of like the Women's World Cup team. Like, you don't care what other people think of you. You just want to win. And I think it's a huge advantage to have those type of athletes on your team because they're going all in. And, and also on the Oregon Project, you've got people coming from all over the world. Not everyone's willing to fly to leave their Germany and come to America, to leave Ethiopia and come to America, to leave Britain and come to America. So these people, they don't care what people think. They don't care where they have to live. They just want to win. It's like the Women's World Cup. Like, we just want to score goals. We'll score 100. We'll celebrate like we would. It's the first one. Wow. And you thought we weren't going to get our Alberto Salazar reference in. Robert sneaks it in at the end. Yeah, congrats to the U.S. women. I think they go, they've they gone – one of the things I'm also impressed by, those women know how to party. They seem to be in a permanent state of drunkenness since winning the World Cup final, which is awesome. I'm loving all the pictures and social media content. They seem like they're having a really fun time. So hats off to them on a dominant performance out in France. And now, without further ado, we've teased it. And now, you guys, your patience has paid off. Here's our exclusive interview with Evan Jager. He tells you everything that's been going on in his life in the last 12 months. Enjoy that. You can listen to it right now. Okay, and we're joined by Evan Jager. He is the American record holder in the steeplechase. He is the Olympic silver medalist. He's the world championship bronze medalist, and he's talking to me right now. So, Evan, where are you at? How, how are you spending today, Saturday? I'm in Portland right now, uh, and this morning just did a 50-minute run on the Alter G, and then uh, another like 50 minutes on the elliptical, and then um, had like a nice solid PT session, like three hours or something like that. So I'm just at home relaxing now. Three hours of physical therapy. Is, is that normal for you or what is, what is that? Like? Uh, no, I've been seeing a, a physio from Vancouver, Canada that Mo has, has been seeing for a number of years now. And just kind of with all the issues that I've had over the past year, I kind of started seeing her and, just really liked working with her. So uh, I've seen her a few times over the past couple months, and she just came into town for like a quick three-day workshop with me and Mo uh, just to kind of touch up on a, a few things. So since she's in town from Vancouver, it's it just kind of it's more time efficient to just put in a couple of big days and have her here for uh, a short amount of time as opposed to like, coming for two weeks and seeing her for an hour a day sure um what's her name uh mary lou what i'm sort of interested in i think you know the track world in general is sort of interested in you haven't raced since mm-hmm. the diamond league final last year it's now yep. july 6th we've got you know three weeks till usa's i mean what's what's going on what's your status uh it's it's been a pretty rough last 
year, year and a half. Right now, I'm I'm back to training. I'm back to running. I know I said I used the Alter G today, but uh, I'm back to running six days a week and workouts and uh, kind of just use uh, Saturday as a cross training day for me right now, cross training with the Alter G. But yeah, it's been a very up and down year since the track season. I guess I'll just start from <laughs> from there. Uh, I had like a bunch of um, a bunch of like ab issues pretty much all of last year from before pre until the end of the track season. I think it was some sort of ab or adductor strain that just was creating a lot of pain in my abs and uh, kind of culminated with a uh, iliacus tear about like 10 days before Zurich. And we were so close to the end of the season. Uh, I had like kind of torn the iliacus in my last big workout before Zurich and uh, didn't really know what was going on until like things just kept getting worse and worse. And I ended up getting an MRI in Zurich the day before the uh, Diamond League final and got the results. And I was worried that I had like a some sort of femur uh, issue going on, but it was just like a partial tear in the iliacus. And I decided just a couple more races, I could deal with the pain and run through it. And um, I think it must have just thrown things off just enough to where uh, I wasn't running and jumping like my normal self. And um, I came down weird on one of the water jumps in the race uh, and ended up, uh, had some pain in my foot, finished the race. And then over the next week, things kind of just got worse and worse. And I ended up having to pull out of Continental Cup and just like literally like 10 minutes before the start of the race and came back to the U.S., got another MRI and basically showed, I was, yeah, showed that I had like a, a bone bruise or a minor stress reaction, but I think it was a little misdiagnosed. So I took like three weeks off, started running again, still had foot pain, took another like three or four weeks off, tried running again and still had foot pain. And I think in total it was like seven weeks off. And so um, people that I had talked to, were kind of assuring me that after seven weeks of no running, the, the bone should definitely be healed. Like I must just be dealing with residual pain and um, kind of ran on that for a few months, started getting back into workouts and then it kind of crept up again. I had a little flare up and then kind of went down in mileage uh, started building back up, got back into workouts, had another little flare up and we were just like, okay, something's definitely not right. And we got another MRI and I had a stress reaction in my, in the same, same bone from the end of the track season. So. And when exactly are we right now? What time, like what time period is that happening? That was like 10 weeks ago. Maybe middle of April. And what what happened from that? So yeah, came back. Yeah, had a, a stress fracture in the talus, um, and so I had to take time off again. I did six weeks on crutches. I was able to cross train the whole time, which was which was nice, helpful. But yeah, no running for another six weeks, and then. Um, after the crutches, I took like another week of just kind of walking around again before I tried doing any sort of running and then did about 10 days of alter G running and then started running outside again and getting back into workouts. So, um, yeah, haven't, it's been a super up and down year. I think a lot of the, ongoing issues and I think a lot of the issues with the foot are kind of a result of 
uh, some of the ab and adductor issues I was dealing with last year. I think I just ended up compensating so much for the other problems that I was dealing with that it just made some other things weak and changed a lot of things and um, kind of kept me in this negative feedback loop of compensating and then injuring myself. So yeah, that, that PT Mary Lou has been super helpful in kind of retraining some of my more natural patterns and re-strengthening things and uh, has helped me get back into running really quickly and um, feeling more like myself than I have in the last like 16 months probably. Do you remember your first day like back running sit on, on solid ground after the mo- the stress fracture was diagnosed? Uh, yeah. Like what day, what day exactly it was? Yeah. Do you remember what it was or I guess what it was, what day it was and what it was like just running on solid ground? Yeah, it it felt awesome, obviously. Um I had had done like a like I don't know, maybe seven or eight runs on the Alter G. So I like I had done a little bit of running, but nothing on solid ground and Mo and I were actually in Vancouver seeing uh, Mary Lou, uh, the the physio and um it was yeah, my first day uh, we went out I went went out for just like a thirty five minute run with Mo and it was um it was kind of the most like myself I had felt running uh since the track season. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I don't know. It was it was just so good to kind of feel like myself again all kind of winter this this whole year I just felt like I had been um, compensating for the foot kind of, it felt like I was just limping around running all year and I was just kind of fighting against my own body every time I was running. And it was just a super frustrating, um, exhausting place to be in. And so, um, yeah, it was just nice just being with Mo. I felt good. Um, and it was, yeah, the first time in a long time where I felt like I, I might actually be able to run pain free again at some point. Where, where did you run in Vancouver? I, well, I guess that was actually in, on Victoria Island, not, not actually Vancouver. We went to Victoria Island cause Mo had uh, a couple of, uh, sports medicine people he wanted to talk with, uh, Trent Stellingworth was one of them. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's at some sports institute uh, in Victoria. And we just ran from, I forget the name of the sports institute. It's like, uh, yeah, I couldn't even tell you what it was, but it was just a nice, uh, like, crushed limestone pass from the campus. You're on, you're running solid ground now. I mean, do you, do you feel you said you felt back to yourself on that day? Have you felt like that since then? Like, do you think all this stuff is finally behind you? Do you feel back to normal now? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely still getting there. Um, I that day was the most like myself I had felt in like since the track season and um, since that first run, things have been feeling better and better and better. Um, I am starting to feel way more like myself. Um, just, yeah, like a normal run like this winter, I just felt like I was like my, my body was just fighting myself and I feel so much more fluid now. I feel like I have some, some bounce to my stride again. I'm not like bracing for impact every time I land on my left foot. So yeah, I, I'm feeling more and more like myself. I wouldn't say that I'm like, like a hundred percent back to normal, but I'm. I definitely feel like I am trending in that direction. Mm-hmm. And when you were on crutches, were you in a? Did you have any sort of walking boot? I did. Um, I did a walking boot for like the first week, but even because uh, I didn't initially want to go on crutches because I was worried about having too much like atrophy in my left leg. 
Um, so I, I started out in the walking boot and I just know, I just felt like the first five days or so, like I still felt, um, pain like in the walking boot. And so I was like, okay, this isn't worth it, worth it. So it's not really helping that much. So I went out of the walking boot and just did like strictly crutches or one of those scooter things. Um, and, uh, just kind of stayed out of the boot so I could kind of keep the range of motion in my ankle and everything. Mm-hmm. Oh, so that's one, one of those scooters where sort of you put your knee on the padded. Yeah. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and what sort of cross training are we doing at that time? Oh my gosh. Everything. Um, <laughs> I was just doing as much cross training as I could possibly stand. So I was, Basically, um, in those six weeks, I was switching off between, um, I'd say like the first uh, three weeks was mostly in the pool. Uh, I was just going back and forth between like aqua jogging and swimming. Mm -hmm. And then after three weeks, I, I started introducing some more stationary biking. So I would do like stationary bike into the pool and either do aqua jog or swimming or both. And, um, just trying to get, I was doing like two to three hours every day of one of those three types of cross training. Mm -hmm. And like, how do you stay, do you have like music you listen to or like, can you watch stuff when you're on the bike? Like, how do you stay sane during three hours of cross training? Oh, yeah, I was listening to podcasts a lot um for the first half of um first half of the 6 weeks and then kind of podcasts got like they weren't really doing it for me anymore so I started watching either like Netflix shows or like movies on my iPad um but obviously like I can't do either of that stuff in the pool so like the Jerry wanted me in the pool more than anything, just because mm-hmm. it was it was going to be absolutely zero impact. So I was just absolutely going insane when I was doing mostly pool stuff, um, and I was so happy to be able to get back onto the bike um, after like three weeks because I don't know. You, I just feel like I get a better workout out of it. I can get my heart rate up higher. You get a sweat going. So you, you actually feel accomplished and, um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, a little more natural for me, I guess. Um, I'm not like a great swimmer. So it's just <laughs> like, I don't know, I'm just not great. Yeah. I, when you're on the pool, I mean, or when you were in the pool, was it just you by yourself? Like, is there a lifeguard? Is there a teammate? Or who was was anyone keeping you company? Um, well, so I was at the Nike pool most of the time, and there's pretty much always someone in there, either swimming or aqua jogging or doing some sort of water aerobics, or they have, like, water yoga sometimes on these inflatable boards. Um, and there's, yeah, there's lifeguards. So I would talk to the lifeguards every once in a while. Most of the time, um, it was, it was me, like a lot of the time, every once in a while, um, Colleen would come and she'd like swim for a little bit with me or, um, Mark was in the pool for a little bit, um, for like secondary stuff like you'd run in the morning and then come to the pool in the afternoon with me for a second like workout session Mm -hmm. um so I was aqua jogging with him for a little bit there um but yeah like a big chunk of the time at least for the first three or four weeks it was it was mostly just me by myself Mm -hmm. so when when those guys would come like Colleen or Mark would you be like Yes, I finally have someone to talk to. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, more so Mark because, I mean, Colleen, she would mostly just swim. So, um, obviously, you can't really talk while you're swimming. But even that was, like, so nice to have at some point sometimes because, like, I just didn't know. 
like she her swimming like we'd be in the same lane and i i would kind of uh get a little bit competitive and try to like keep up with her mm-hmm. even though she's she's a lot better swimmer than i am so uh it was nice having that little bit of i don't know competitive spirit being awoken again uh with someone else um and then like mark aqua jogging it was yeah it's just so nice to have someone to talk to again just because just miss that time with with the boys um on you know the everyday runs uh cross training you're just on your own for so much of the time just with your headphones or your thoughts and it's yeah it's it's a pretty lonely place for sure yeah so did you did you miss out on like all the gossip in the spring like when you do you feel like out of the loop when you get back to train with these guys yeah for sure a little bit um (laughs) I'd still catch up with the guys every once in a while. And we, we definitely, we have like a text thread, um, that we're just constantly talking on basically. Um, Uh so I didn't feel like I was too out of the loop, but there is a part of you that feels like you're not really on the team because you're not running every day. Uh Um, and like, you can just tell that people feel bad that, you're in this injured state and I, it's just like this weird place where you know that people feel bad for you and you feel bad for yourself and um yeah it's just awkward it's just it's just not fun i mean yeah. everyone just always wants to be able to just go out and run all the time so anytime you're kind of you have that taken away from you it's just a it's tough yeah. Well, I, I remember when I was in college, like, so the joke was anyone on our team, like, if you got injured, you could just kind of start turning into an asshole. Like, I remember I kind of got hurt my senior year and I would just be in a bad mood constantly because I couldn't go out and do this one thing that I really, really wanted to do more than anything else. Do, do you feel like, do you find your personality changes at all? Like, do you get more snippy and stuff when you're not able to run or do you just absorb it all right? Um. I feel like I actually, this time, I I was definitely in a way worse place this winter um, just because I was constantly being told that the the bone in my foot should definitely be healed. Like, I took so much time off that, like, it's definitely healed and whatever pain I was dealing with was kind of something else. And to constantly have the feedback from your foot that it, that it hurts and something is definitely wrong and like thinking that the bone is healed it's something else that kind of drove me crazy uh on top of like being in pain every day and not feeling like myself running i was just in a much much worse place um this fall and winter uh i'd say that i probably was just more down or like almost in like a depressed state this winter than Uh being like angry at my teammates or snippy or anything um and like oddly enough this this last kind of time around getting the mri and getting the results that uh the bone still wasn't healed um like while it did suck and like obviously no one wants to take time off and not be able to run it was also a little bit of a relief um just knowing exactly what was going on um knowing that if like i i took another six weeks off like the bone should heal and i was going to do it properly this time with crutches and non-weight bearing um just kind of having some knowledge of what was going on and having a plan moving forward and some direction was kind of a real, a little bit of a relief. Um, just knowing that I wasn't like crazy that I had this pain in my foot still. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, it was weird, but, um, yeah, it's just, you feel a little secluded not being with the team day in and day out. And then, um, obviously like, not being able to go up to altitude camps or 
just working out and uh, just getting that feeling of putting in the work and knowing that you got better on the day. Uh, yeah, it's just, you just miss out on a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, is there a reason that you, you said you kind of knew that something was wrong, even though you've been resting, there's still pain. Was, was this just misdiagnosed? Like, why is it that it took until <clears throat> April to like definitively say there was a stress fracture? Yeah. So it, it was initially misdiagnosed. Um, I had a, so when I had the second MRI this spring in April, um, I went to another radiologist. Like I, I had the MRI done and we took the results to another ra- radiologist different from the one this fall. And he read this report and then he also got the, I like, I gave him the images from the uh, MRI done in September and he read that and he he's like oh yeah like looking at this like I would have classified this as an impact fracture um, instead of a bone bruise which is what I was told in the fall so in the fall I was told okay you have a bone bruise you don't need to go into a boot you don't need crutches if you just take six or sorry three weeks off of running you should be fine. Like definitely like no problem. Mm -hmm. And I ended up taking seven weeks off of running and it's, I still had pain all, all fall and winter uh, after coming back. And he's like, yeah, I would have classified this as an impact fracture. Um, You typically, you don't really see it in runners. It's like super uncommon injury for runners, which is possibly why it, might have been misdiagnosed you you typically see it in um snowboarders uh because they're in this boot and when they come down and have a hard impact they kind of land on their heels and the force is driven up like through their calcaneus into their talus which is like the exact place where i had my fracture so he was like yeah i would have probably told you to to take six weeks off and go on crutches initially um so, yeah, I was obviously misdiagnosed, but at the same time, I like, I think uh, I had so many other issues last year that were not addressed because I was coming back from this foot issue and I was kind of focusing all my energy on the foot when I resumed training that I kind of neglected the other issues um, from the previous six months. So there was like a lot of stuff um, that had just been built up and I had kind of found ways to manage it without kind of fully fixing the issue. And Mm -hmm. it kind of just all came crashing down at the same time, basically. Yeah. But that, that impact fracture, um, you said it was that, that came from like, landing awkwardly during the yeah lyric. yeah do you know exactly which was it a water jump or a stun barrier do you know exactly which one like could you tell during the race uh yeah i felt it during the race um i it was middle of the race maybe third or fourth lap uh it was one of the water jumps i came down and like i said i, I had torn my celiacus 10 days before so like i think i was just running weird or like on the landing, I didn't have the strength to like absorb the impact as I normally would uh-huh. because of the iliacus tear. And uh-huh. so I remember coming down and like slamming my foot pretty hard or feeling like I jammed my foot. And I was, I remember thinking like that definitely hurt, but just being the adrenaline of the race and everything, it kind of like numbed out 200 meters later. And I, I didn't feel it for the rest of the race, but as soon as I finished um, and tried cooling down, like my foot was pretty sore. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting because that's also obviously the same race that Concepless won running yeah. with one two. Yeah. Yeah. His, like, his yeah. feet are probably a little bit stronger than mine. I, I guess. I mean, I guess we have the evidence now. But uh, sorry, I don't. I don't want to make light of uh, what you've suffered the last, you know, uh, 
10 months or whatever. That's, that's pretty, it's rough, I'm sure. Um, yeah. Your your form, though, like, did you, like, you mentioned that the the hair in your, you know, your ass that you, you felt like your form changed a little bit. Like, do you, is there anything specific you could point to, like, that felt out of balance? Or, like, did you notice, did you find yourself making uh, adjustments? Like, do you remember anything specific? Do you mean over this, like, since the foot injury, my form? No, no. Back when you were running, like, the end of the 2018 track season, like, how was your form different? Do you know exactly where the imbalance was or, like, what you did to compensate? I mean, yeah, I, I could get into it if you if you really want me to. It's kind of complicated. You give me, give me, we can give it a try. Okay. Uh, so, basically, my... It's, the, it's kind of uh, the iliacus tear is kind of just like it's just like the the signal saying something was wrong. Um, the real problem was like I had this this adductor this adductor pain um, that kind of kind of crept its way like up into my lower abs. So um, basically, every time I started a run um, from like May until the beginning of August, like I would have this kind of like tearing sensation in my low abs. And it was just like super painful every time I started to run. And then, um, so like every time, like I would start a stride or start a workout, I would get that same sensation. And it kind of was throughout the rest of the day as well. So like, sitting up from laying down, I got that pain and sneezing. I got that pain and like laying down from a sitting up position. I got that pain. So what ended up happening is I kind of, uh, to kind of protect myself, I kind of stopped using my abs and started using my upper body as like a way to brace myself. So like anytime I would stand up, I would like, use my arms to push myself up and then stand up and then kind of same thing sitting down I would use my arms and so uh like my shoulders and my chest and everything started kind of naturally just getting tight to kind of protect for, from that pain and also like not using my abs anymore I obviously lost a lot of core strength and so um i don't know how exactly it resulted with my form but i just um it was less apparent in the track season because i was still so fit and like kind of firing all on all cylinders but it was way more apparent um when i started training back up this year after the foot injury um my like upper body was just super tense and um like very rigid and i like just had no pop off the track um Mm -hmm. yeah i i don't really know it's kind of hard yeah it's pretty involved and hard to explain but yeah um but i think i got it you know a decent idea at this point um but it sounds like so you had to rebuild your core strength as well as you're coming back from this foot injury, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'm still still working on it now. Um, it's like so much better than it was even like six weeks ago. Right now, um, but like I said, I I still don't feel like a hundred percent normal running yet. But mm-hmm. I'm I'm getting there. And are you, you know, are you working out with guys in Portland or are they, it seems like a bunch of them have been at altitude recently. Like what are you, who are you doing workouts with these days? Yeah. A lot of the track guys are in Park City. Um, I've, I've just been working out on my own since I was been back just because, I mean, at this point, everyone else is so much fitter than I am that it kind of doesn't really make sense to jump into workouts with everyone out i mean mo is here and like it would just be disastrous to start working out with mo right now so um yeah i'm just doing stuff 
on my own and I'm literally like just getting back into working out. I did my first workout like a week ago. So, and when I say workout, I, it's not even really a workout. What was it? Um, my, my very first workout, uh, yeah. it was just two, two miles of what we call ins and outs, just kind of striding the straights and jogging the turns. Um, but I mean, that was, that was like two weeks maybe after my first run. So um, it's still pretty, yeah, it was two weeks after my first run. So um, I didn't want to be too aggressive um, so short after coming off of crutches. But, um, yeah, came off of it really well and um, had a, a good solid week of, training this week so um yeah um, yeah things have gone well this week and um better than the week before and better than the week before so that's kind of what i'm just focused on right now is just improving and giving myself a chance yeah so i guess the one thing i was curious so you haven't have you done any workouts with the other olympic medalists in the bowman track club now with matthew centrowitz uh, yeah, I did a couple of workouts with him this spring. Um, he had, uh, he had some, some issues this spring as well. And so, um, kind of my, my second time getting back into workouts, maybe in like February or March or something like that, we were kind of in the same place where we were just starting workouts again. And, uh, yeah, we got to do, um a couple workouts together maybe two um i mean obviously nothing crazy just like basic strength work with some faster reps on the end or something like that Mm -hmm. so where would you mind at like you know usa's three weeks from this weekend Mm -hmm. what are you thinking of your chances to make the team? Like, where does your fitness, where do you think you are right now? Like, what what is your mindset right now? Um, I mean, I, my mindset is I'm, I'm planning on racing USA's. Um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I think I have the opportunity to gain a ton of fitness in the next three weeks, just, based off the fact that I'm three weeks into running. Um, So the plan is to just be on a get fit quick program where we do kind of more frequent, smaller hit workouts um, as opposed to two workouts a week that are like, I don't know, like 10 miles long one day and five miles long the other day. Uh, So we'll probably do more workouts, um, but less volume um, throughout the week. And there'll be like faster reps, um, just trying to (laughs) kind of cheat fitness a little bit and get fit as quick as possible, kind of skip over some of the base phase stuff and get right into race pace and speed, basically. Uh Uh-huh. Have you, when was the last time you ran over a, a hurdle or a barrier? Uh, Zurich. And is the plan to do some of that work before USA's or no? Uh, yes, that's the plan. Um, I think, um, I mean, I'm going to take things as they come. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, like try to do water jumps um like a lot just just to do them just to get ready for the race i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'll squeeze in hurdling and water jumps um when i feel like my body is ready to do those things mm-hmm. um honestly i i feel like that is the last piece to the puzzle right now uh mm-hmm. i'm more worried about doing workouts and getting as fit as possible and staying healthy at this, at this point. And, um, 
if I don't go over hurdles or water jumps until the week before the race, I'm, I'm okay with that, uh-huh. to be honest. Um, I, I feel like I probably only need like one session hurdling and one session water jumping to feel confident enough to race a steeplechase. Uh-huh. And I'm, I'm guessing it sounds like there's not going to be any races before USA. That's going to be your 2019 opener. Um, not necessarily. Uh, I think we're keeping things open. Um, I've, there's, there's no definite plan to, um, uh-huh. USA is really all that I'm thinking of, of, but, um, if, if Jerry feels like it's the right thing to do to to do a race before USA's, I'm I'm totally open to it. And um I think we're I mean we're definitely we have a very open dialogue right now, talking every day about how I'm feeling, running, how I came off the last workout, how everything's feeling. So um yeah, we're basically just taking everything day by day. Um and trying to push the envelope as much as my body is willing to be pushed. Yeah. Um, Is there any fear that, you know, going over a barrier again, landing on the foot, testing out the foot? Like, what is your thought process behind that at the moment? Um, My thought process actually is worst case scenario, if my foot doesn't feel 100%, I think I could probably hurdle and water jump with, with one leg throughout the race. Um, that's, that's like worst case scenario. Um, water jumping, it would not, not be a problem. Uh, that's pretty, I mean, both are pretty easy to gauge. Um, I mean, there's been, I'm sure plenty of people that have only hurdled and water jumped with one leg. I know Dan has done it in the past. Um, I'm pretty sure Henry Marsh did it. I I feel like he only ever hurdled and water jumped with one leg. I'm I may be wrong on that, but um, yeah, if worst comes to worst, I'll just jump off my right leg for everything, and I don't think that would be too big of an issue. Um, but I mean, obviously, ideally, uh, everything just feels good at the time of the race and I don't really have to worry about that. Mm-hmm. But if, if you'd be jumping off your right leg, like over mm-hmm. a regular barrier, you'd still be landing on the left foot, which is the the problem one, right? So is it, is yeah. it more of an issue to, is it more of an issue pushing off or landing? Uh, well, I think it would be more of an issue like jumping for a normal hurdle like pushing mm-hmm. off for a normal barrier and then obviously like landing in the water fit would be the biggest issue um yeah. but yeah you do if i push off on the if i jump on the right leg for the water fit and then push off the barrier with my left and then land on the right that's that's pretty easy um there's like minimal force going into my left leg there uh, for the normal barriers, I, re- I don't think that landing for the normal hurdles would be that big of an issue. Mm-hmm. Have you have you done this in the past, or have you always been sort of ambidextrous with hurdling? No, yeah, I've always done both legs, even mm-hmm. from the first day that I tried hurdles. I I did both legs, so yeah, it would definitely be a new experience. But um, I mean, I feel like with with steepling it's just like it's this weird innate ability to kind of judge like 10 meters out which leg is going to come up uh, and it's pretty i mean it's pretty easy to kind of just choose which leg you want and make that work what was the most frustrating thing about the last you know 10 11 months of this injury <laughs> Um, the most frustrating thing was definitely, um, feeling like I couldn't run like myself. I was like, 
feeling like I couldn't get my body to do what I wanted it to do. Um, I think it was mainly because of the pain uh, that I was feeling in my foot. Like my, my body was just not letting me run in its normal pattern because that would have been painful. And so it was like immediate, it was just automatically shutting some muscles off from running normally and it was just naturally compensating no no matter how hard I tried to run normally and um just not being able to get that go away and not being able to just kind of run relaxed I was the I can specifically remember w- one moment that was the most frustrating uh I was doing a workout with the guys um it was kind of like a faster session I think it was like 200s uh off of short rest and nothing fast like 30 second 200s or something like that and immediately had foot pain and was trying to run through it um and like i said i was running super rigid and super tight and jerry kept telling me to relax like he's like you're not running like yourself just relax just like run loose and I was like I can't, I can't do that he's like yes you can like you just need to like forget about like having good form and just like just let your body flow and I literally I could not do it and it was um it was just like a very helpless feeling um just being in pain dealing with pain every day and on top of that like feeling like you're just fighting your own body and um yeah it was like I just I think what was so frustrating was knowing that like no matter how bad like I was trying to tough it out there was absolutely no way I could run at my highest level feeling the way that I was feeling and um yeah it was that was super frustrating yeah, I can't imagine really a more frustrating feeling than that, just knowing, you know, knowing how good you can be and knowing how you feel running and not. But yeah, I, I just, it's got to be incredibly yeah. frustrating. Yeah, um, it was it was terrible. <laughs> when, when was, when and where was that workout? Do you remember exactly? Uh, it was at Nike. It was, I'm sure it was, it was just terrible weather. I'm sure it was like cold and wet. Um, and, oh gosh, when was that? Um, let me see. I might have it in my logs if I can pull it up. I, I stopped logging a lot of stuff just because I was so frustrated. Mm. Um, what kind of log do you use? I just use like Google Sheets, mm-hmm. just a little little spreadsheet. Yep. Uh, this this I'll I'll get back to you on that. Okay. It might, it might take me a little bit to find it. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Is there any positives you can draw from this injury? Anything that you were able to do that you want, like you have more time to do something else outside of running or anything? No, I've been so much more busy being injured than I ever was healthy. Really? (laughs) Yeah, I've spent more time training, doing rehab, PT, like cross-training. Like I have to cross-train for more time to get kind of the same effect as mm-hmm. running um yeah and this i mean it was kind of worse this fall and winter because i was seeing a pt here in portland and i was like trying to do the right thing so i was seeing him i saw him every day like or five days a week for like two months and then like three days a week like for like three or four months after that. And um, yeah, I feel like I spent more time trying to get healthy um, this time around. And uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, I mean, there, there have, there's definitely, Man, I have realized that I can cross train a lot more than I ever thought I was uh, capable of. Um, I never would have thought that I could, yeah, do as much cross training as I have these last six weeks. 
Um, so I guess that's that's positive, knowing that I can push myself further than I thought, even yeah. 11 years into my career. Are you still thing. are you still cross training like right now in addition to running? Yeah, for sure. And that is what kind of cross training? Um, mostly stationary bike and elliptical right now. Roughly how much per, how much time per day? Um, so I've been trying to get at least two hours of exercise in. So like if I do like a 50 minute run, I'll get another 70 minutes of cross training in after. Mm -hmm. So, um, like basically 70 to 90 minutes of cross training. So how many, like how many miles did you run this week on uh, between Ulta G and regular, I guess, did you run the Ulta G at all? Like what was your mileage this week? Um, well, uh, last week I ran 50, mm -hmm. um, that's including Alter G, not including, mm -hmm. not including, uh, cross training this mm -hmm. week. Um, well, we're not done yet, but, mm -hmm. uh, this week will probably be uh, probably a little bit more than that, maybe 55 or 56. Mm-hmm. And how much of it is coming on the Ulta G? Uh, just just one run. Just uh, same as last week. Uh, yeah, just one run last week. And what sort of stuff are you doing? Like, this, you had three hours of physical therapy today. What kind of stuff are you doing in in that session? Uh, a lot of it is just release, releasing uh, some tight muscles kind of everywhere like releasing my foot um my foot still tends to get like a little locked up um calf is a little tight so releasing the calf um but most of it is the upper body just from all that kind of all that tightness i was having this winter mm -hmm. um part of it was the compensation but i think also a lot a big part of it was just uh, i was carrying a lot of my mental and emotional stress in my chest i was just kind of very tight up top to i don't know she, the the physio says like i was just carrying my stress up top and i was making everything tight uh so just kind of releasing that um shoulders ribs pecs neck back triceps uh, everything <laughs> And you get like exercises to release it, or is it massage or, or what? Uh, yeah, that's more like deep tissue massage, or like or ART, or like dry needling, and then um, yeah, and then like that's probably two hours, and then the last hour is kind of like going over exercises to re-strengthen everything and um, kind of get those correct firing patterns kind of back in order I, I think that's pretty much it going to do it for the injury we've been talking about that for an hour i know it's probably not something that you have a lot of fun rehashing and, and talking about so i do appreciate you yeah. opening up about that and hopefully yeah we won't talk about it again it's okay i haven't done too many or any interviews in the last year so it's, it's okay going to usa's i mean obviously you don't have the standard for world but is there yeah. any worry there in the you know it's probably gonna take running the standard to make the team anyway, right? Yeah, I mean basically every uh I I'm, there may be like one year at USA's that we haven't run under eight twenty nine. Mm -hmm. Um and, but I don't even know I I would yeah, basically every year has been under like mid to low eight twenties or faster. Um so I, I mean, I kind of think that the race will just go that fast. I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to run, not hard to run slower than that, but like it feels, it usually feels really, really easy at a championship race if you're running slower than 830 pace for most of the race. Um, mm -hmm. So I would, it's kind of just, 
natural that people go out in like 68 or 69 and keep it there and then kick, which would give you a mid 820s race. So, and I know from talking to you last year and just through the years, I know that winning the steeple at USA's every year means a lot to you. You know, you, you've won seven straight, which is tied for Henry, with Henry Marsh. And last year, I think you said you were willing to run it at two in the morning or whatever, <laughs> the weather delay, just, just to make sure that you defend your title successfully. I mean, yeah. is, is that, how worried are you about that streak possibly ending? Is it like, do you think it's unfair that it will be injury and not like someone like Hillary Bohr, who almost won a Diamond League this year, coming out and, you know, sort of just beating you fair and square? Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it's definitely not unfair. Um, injuries are part of the sport and everyone deals with injuries. So it's, I'm not, I don't think it's unfair in the slightest bit. I mean, I know Hillary was has been dealing with injuries the past couple of years and everyone's had their injuries. Um, so yeah, it's definitely not unfair. Um, I would definitely be a little bummed, um, to go to USA's and, and not win. But at the same time, if I can, I feel like if I can make this team with everything that I've dealt with, the last year, I would still be super proud of myself for kind of battling through everything, sticking with it, keeping a positive face on and giving my best effort and, and trying to make the team. So, um, yeah, it would be, it would definitely be bittersweet. Um, I mean, if I didn't make the team, I would just be all sorts of bummed, but, uh, but yeah, like I, I'm just going to give myself every shot to, to make team. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying not to think about it too much. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, you know, I'll, you know, I'll see you three weeks in Des Moines. Hopefully, uh, you're a lot fitter and still healthier then. <laughs> um, yeah. 